the number of ways to deploy containers on AWS is too damn high. And often it can be very frustrating when trying to decide which of the many different container-based services is right for your application. And so that's the main motivation behind this video. I wanna talk about seven of the most common ways that you can deploy containers on AWS services. And so the goal of this video is not only to inform you about which services are there as options, but also to talk about some of the different pros and cons of each of the different services so that you'll know which one is right for your application and which one you may want to avoid. I'm also going to talk about two key services that I think you should avoid and not use if you're deciding to use containers for reasons that we'll talk about later. And we'll get to that towards the end of the video. Now, this is a kind of decision tree flowchart style presentation, and I will make this graphic or this image uh, once it's fully revealed available to you so that you can download it in case you want to keep it as a cheat sheet if you ever need to decide about containers again in the future. So let's just get right into it. And first, we're going to zoom into the top section here. And so let's start asking some questions and filtering our requirements so that we can decide when it makes sense to use which of these services. So the first question that you need to ask yourself is, are you going to be using Kubernetes? And Kubernetes is the popular container management service built by Google. Um, it's open source and used very regularly in many different workspaces. And so if you are using Kubernetes, we're going to go in the left direction here. And you only really have one choice for you here, uh, which is why I put this as the first question. It's the first filtering question. Uh, so so if you are using Kubernetes, then you're going to want to use EKS or Elastic Kubernetes Service. So EKS is a fully managed AWS service for Kubernetes. So it handles things like all the infrastructure setup, all the provisioning. You can still customize a bunch of the different options, but the work of setting up the cluster and managing it is all done by the EKS service itself. So in terms of the pros of this service, like I mentioned, it's fully managed. It's also highly scalable. It's very easy to add additional pods or modify the resources that you need. It's also very highly available. So you can disperse your pods across different availability zones so that if any portion of the data center that you deploy in goes down, then you'll still be able to maintain your application and you'll still be able to serve traffic. Now, in terms of the cons of this service, uh, if, for, if it's your first time setup, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, a, you're gonna have to learn how Kubernetes Kubernetes works and then B, how EKS as a service works. So if you don't already know about how Kubernetes works in the first place, then it's going to be very difficult for you to set up EKS. So just keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that pricing is resource based. So if you need instances that have additional or more CPU or more memory or more power in general, then you're going to have to pay more for that. Um, so this was kind of a simple question, kind of a softball here. But if you're using Kubernetes, then EKS is the choice for you. OK, so let's skip to the case of no, that you're not using Kubernetes. What are what is the next question that you need to ask yourself? Um, so ultimately, you need to ask yourself, do you want to use serverless or provision? Uh, serverless is extremely popular these days just because of its ease of use. And so let's talk about that first. And so there's one more kind of test question here uh, in order for us to decide which service to go with, which is, are your invocations less than or greater than 15 minutes? So is each execution of your application going to be less than 15 minutes or greater? Um, the reason it matters is that if we go in the left direction here, one of the constraints is that it can't run for more than 15 minutes. And let's just spoil it here. So that service is Lambda. So if you're less than 15 minutes, then you're going to want to go with the AWS Lambda service. So Lambda is kind of a, an older service, but very, very popular in the serverless world. And most recently, about two or so years ago, they launched the ability to deploy containers on your Lambda functions. Typically, you just write code, you write Lambda functions, and then AWS AWS packages up those functions, deploys them onto machines. And then when a request comes in, it'll kind of find the right machine and respond to it, yada, yada, yada. Um, so that's how lambdas were typically used, just writing raw functions. But now you can actually deploy images onto them, which is pretty neat. Uh, so in terms of the pros of using Lambda in this case, well, it's extremely low maintenance, very, very easy to set up and use. You're not having to worry about any of the underlying infrastructure pretty much at all. Lambda is also really, really effective for event orchestration or event-based services, but it's viable for APIs too. 
Um, now, why I say it's great for event-based orchestration or event-based services is because Lambda is a pay for what you use type service. And so when you are not having any invocations, you don't pay anything. So you just basically pay for the number of invocations that you have, the amount of memory that gets consumed or provisioned, and the duration of those invocations, which makes it really, really great for event processing because you don't necessarily need instances that are up and running at all times to process events only when there's a high number of events or only when there's like greater than zero do you want your instances to be run. So again, it's very, very effective from the cost management side of things. Uh, now it can also work for APIs as well, although there are some problems with using Lambdas to host APIs, mainly in the form of cold starts, which is actually one of the cons here, so cold starts. And cold starts are the idea that when a request comes in, since we're not managing any of the underlying infrastructure, when a request comes in, Lambda needs to load your application code onto an underlying instance that's going to serve your request, typically an EC2 instance. And so if your application hasn't gotten any requests recently, that process of finding an instance, loading your code and all your dependencies onto it, and then making it available for the execution before finally invoking it, that's called cold start. And that can take quite a bit of time in some cases. And so if you're using containers as well, and you have a very large image with a whole bunch of dependencies for things like TensorFlow or whatever, then you may run into some very long cold start problems. So this is something to be aware of if you're using the Lambda service. Now, the other main thing is that 15 minute execution limit. So you can't have a Lambda function running for more than 15 minutes. This means that it's not effective for things like ML jobs or data processing or anything like large batch style jobs. You'll either have to use a different container based service or have to chunk your work into smaller bits so that it can be under 15 minutes when you actually invoke your function. So that's it for Lambda. Let's move on now to the right here, which is if you want to go with serverless and your invocations are greater than 15 minutes, uh, there's one more question here, which is, do you want to control all the knobs? So all the configuration, um, do you want it to be very, very simple or do you want it to control everything and have full customization of your container cluster? And so if the answer is yes, if you do want to control all the knobs, then there's one service that's for you, which is ECS Fargate. And Fargate is a kind of version of ECS, which is Elastic Container Service, but it's a fully managed container orchestration service. So you can set up like a ECS or a Fargate service and maintain a certain set of containers at all times so that if any request comes in, then your cluster will be able to respond to that traffic immediately. There's also no limitations on the duration of invocations like we saw in Lambda. So it can be greater than 15 minutes if you wish, which makes uh, Fargate a much better choice for long running tasks or tasks where you don't want to suffer from cold start and need to respond right away. Also for services that have very steady state traffic, then Fargate is going to be a great choice for you. Uh, so in terms of some of the other pros of using Fargate, so like I mentioned, great for ad hoc long running task, and it's also completely serverless. Um, so the EC2 instances that are running your containers or your tasks behind the scenes, you never see them, you never hear about them, you never have to manage them. All you're dealing with are your tasks, which are the abstractions that AWS introduces for you in the Fargate service to correlate with your images. And you decide how much resources that you'd like to provision as part of those tasks. Uh, now, in terms of the cons of Fargate, there's not really that many, but uh, it's good to know that you do have to pay a premium if you were contrasting using Fargate over something like uh, EC2, for instance, because you're getting some abstraction on top of using EC2s, and so you're paying a little bit more on the hourly basis for the resources that you consume. Uh, so let's keep on going here. Uh, if you don't want to control all the knobs, so if you're a simpleton or a pleb like me, and you don't want to care about things like load balancing, VPC networking, um, the specifics of how your containers are managed, then you want to go with something for plebs, which is AWS App Runner, which is a more um, modern service as well, or maybe not modern, but more recently launched. Uh, and the pros of using App Runner is that it's basically almost exactly the same as Fargate, but just a whole lot simpler. 
behind the scenes app runner uses Fargate. So it's just another level of abstraction on top of using Fargate. So it's, it's basically Fargate for dummies. So you just point it to your containers, you fill out some very, very simple options, and then you're, you're off to the races deploying your containers and running it. It also does support load balancing. So if you need to uh, deploy large throughput applications, that's definitely viable for using, for going with app runner. Uh, in terms of the cons, you probably would have guessed it, but it's more expensive than if you were to use Fargate itself uh, at the cost of your time. Uh, you know, you, you pay more, but you don't have to worry about a bunch of configuration, which can be good for some people. Uh, and then some of the cons, well, I guess this can be a pro or a con, but lack of control. Maybe this is a good thing for you, but for a lot of people, it could be a bad thing as well. Um, so App Runner is the final choice for the serverless world. Uh, so let's retract up here and go to serverless or provision. Now we're going to go down the provision track. Okay, so one test question here, which is, do you want a easy to set up and nice looking modern UI? If you do, then you're going to want to go on yes path here, which is on the left hand side here. And spoiler, the service that I'm about to show you is actually the one that I use to host and deploy my WordPress website or WordPress based website, which is beabetterdev.com. So I have a lot of experience with this service and I have some pretty positive things to say about it, but it is of course, AWS LightSail. So for those of you that have used um, other providers that are not AWS that make it easy to set up like, you know, uh, a LAMP stack or a mean stack or some kind of database or a droplet, like if it's like digital ocean, uh, LightSail is very similar to that. It's kind of like setting up an instance for dummies. Um, and so in terms of some of the pros, it's like the simplest UI setup that you could possibly imagine. They make it very, very easy for you. It's also in like a whole different section of the AWS console, which is interesting. Uh, so it's like a containerized, no pun intended, but a containerized kind of ecosystem in which you, you work and um, deploy your resources into. And so um, very, very intuitive, easy to use, lots of documentation. You don't have access to a lot of the things that you typically would if you were just using like a different service such as Fargate um, or App Runner. So uh, the, the TLDR is that LightSail is a very high level of abstraction if you want to deploy containers. So great for kind of prototypes or simple applications or websites, stuff where you just don't want to have to worry about all the details. And in terms of the cons of LightSail, you kind of get locked into this ecosystem of the LightSail world. Um, although like you can get out of this. They do have the ability to migrate out to things like EC2 or Fargate, but you just need to jump through some hoops. But overall, I really, really like using LightSail and it's viable for deploying containers as well. Okay, if you decide that you don't care about the nice and easy UI and you still wanna go with provisioned, then you need to ask yourself one more question. Do you want or need container orchestration? So do you want your containers to be managed by some kind of service for you or are you uh, just gonna kind of do it yourself? or you don't care. So if the answer is yes, you do want container orchestration, then you really only have one remaining service at your disposal to use, which is ECS or Elastic Container Service, which is very, very similar to Fargate. In fact, they are part of the same section of the AWS console. Uh, Fargate is a kind of a, a deployment option for ECS, but ECS, how it typically runs is on EC2 instances. And I actually have a whole video comparing this, like ECS on Fargate versus on EC2. You can go and watch that if you wanna learn more about the details here. But the TLDR is that if you go with ECS plus EC2, then you manage the underlying infrastructure in which your containers are gonna be deployed on. So you need to worry about the, those EC2 instances. You need to worry about things like security, things like patches, things like updates, all that kind of stuff, like replacement of them, although that's done automatically, but you're managing the underlying infrastructure, which can be good and it can also be bad. It depends on what your perspective is. Uh, and so the pros is that you get full control. You get to control everything from the load balancer, the networking, the EC2 instances, the VPC, uh, pretty much everything there is. In terms of the cons, there is a very steep learning curve. You're gonna have to know how EC2 works behind the scenes. You're gonna have to learn about how ECS works. You're gonna have to learn about how ECS integrates with containers as well. Uh, I've used ECS on EC2 before. It's a little bit uh, daunting and it does take quite a bit of time to get up and running to understand exactly what's happening. If you're looking for a simpler approach, like maybe you wanna get started with ECS, I would start with Fargate. It, it really simplifies a bunch of things for you. And if you 
you find that Fargate isn't working for your use case, then you can switch to EC2, um, which is kind of easy to do as well. Okay, so that's it for ECS. The last one now, which is if you went provisioned, you don't want an easy to set up UI and you don't want a container orchestration, then you just have one choice left. And that is Elastic Compute Cloud, which is one of the oldest AWS services out there. Uh, Elastic Compute Cloud is just basically renting virtual machines. And with them, you can do whatever you want, including deploying containers. Um, and so in terms of some of the pros, similar to what we saw in ECS, you get full control. Like these are your virtual machines. You can do with them what you please. Um, you can deploy a container that mines Bitcoin if you want, although I think that's against the terms of service. So maybe don't do that. Um, but you can effectively kind of set these up however you want. You may need to use a supplementary service such as Code Deploy to deploy your containers onto them if you don't want to just like install them locally, like run the commands. Uh, they don't, that'll make it a little bit more uh, resilient in case like your, your machines get replaced behind the scenes. Um, now, in terms of some of the cons of EC2, um, it can be very frustrating to set up and maintain. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to worry about with EC2s, including AMIs, networking, security groups. There's like the full gamut of things. Also, if you go with EC2, you don't have any kind of container orchestration. So you may want to use this if you're just deploying like a single container to do some kind of ad hoc job. Uh, but I, I don't really suggest to actually use EC2 if you're going to deploy containers, maybe just for like some experimentation or something. But um, in the grand scheme of things, there's a whole bunch of other services that are at your disposal here that are much, much better. And so with that, I now want to talk about two services that you should avoid for sure. Uh, the first one is the one that we were just talking about, which is EC2. There is really no reason to use EC2 these days with all these different choices at our disposal. So just avoid it, don't use it. It's not worth your time. Use one of these other ones that are much, much better. The second one to avoid is Elastic Beanstalk. This is a service I didn't talk about. It's not one of the seven ways to deploy containers. Although you can, like it could be the eighth way, but I just suggest you'd never use this. Why? Well, it's kind of great for prototypes and simple applications, but if you want to venture out of that, then it's gonna be kind of painful to do so. And Elastic Beanstalk is also an extremely, extremely old service as well. App Runner kind of um, takes over what the functionality of Elastic Beanstalk offered. And so if you see Elastic Beanstalk, um, it does give you things like you know a load balancer, VPC connectivity, all that kind of stuff, which is great but it's not really worth it because you have tools like AppRunner at your disposal, which are actually a million times easier. And so AppRunner is a great replacement for Elastic Beanstalk, so the TLDR is just do not use it. And so these are the seven different ways that you can deploy containers on AWS. Again, I'll make this cheat sheet available to you as a download if you wanna keep this, but thanks so much for watching. Let me know if I missed anything and hopefully you enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.